All right, folks, uh, welcome back. We're going to take a look at flux core uh, kind of basics, uh, getting the wire feed tuned in and then uh, fillet welds in the horizontal, vertical up and overhead position. Um, so we're going we're to kind of jump right in. Um, in the video footage that's shot here, and I, I, I hope it gets better as time goes on, um, I am uh, running 052 diameter flux core uh, wire. I'm running uh, C25 shielding gas, uh, and we basically are running somewhere in the neighborhood of 24 volts on the machine. Now, I wouldn't think too much in terms of uh, voltage setting. You're going to have to tune in your wire, whether it be 030, 045, 052, 116, whatever it is, based on the application. But the basic techniques in this clip don't really change all that much. Um, I, I would say that... Uh, you're, you're, you're going to want to probably be, have your wire feeder in a position where you can weld with one hand and, and make adjustments with the other. And in fact, that's what I'm doing uh, in this clip, although you can't see that because the camera's focused solely on the work. So let's kind of get started. Um, you have to have a rough idea as to what it is that you're welding. Um, but for structural applications, I would say, you know, 22 volts is probably on the low end. 24, 25 in that range is probably... Uh, closer to what might be an average, but pick a voltage, okay, any voltage. And this really doesn't matter if you're welding um, at home or any place else. You're just going to set that knob somewhere. And then I'm going to pull the trigger and I'm going to start welding. What I'm looking for is really the machine to run fairly smooth and more importantly, I'm listening to uh, the machine. So I prefer to start off with my wire speed a little on the low side. If it starts off high and it's going stump, 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 you know, it's not really even wanting to strike an arc because you've got a poor ground or, or whatever, so be it. Just adjust that wire until you get a stable arc. And then I will essentially weld with one hand and then I'm going to turn the wire speed knob with the other. I'm going to turn it down until it's a quiet hiss with no real crackle and then I'm going to bring it up till I get a light crackle like you'd have if you're you know, sitting by a campfire or maybe uh, if you've got a fireplace at home, just a, a, a light, light little, every now and then a little crackle. And then I'm gonna turn that up just a little bit more. From that position, what I really want is I wanna try to weld in the vertical position. If I can weld verticals, then I can pretty much weld anything. So I'm gonna always prefer to tune my machine in uh, on the vertical position. And I might fine tune it in other positions, but if I have to pick one position, to adjust my machine for all position work, it's gonna be uphill every time. So in that uphill position, we're gonna have a weld puddle. And that weld puddle is, is roughly uh, shaped like this. So if we have a, a plate uh, that's tacked together in a T-joint configuration, and, uh, or in this case, I guess in my drawing, it's more of a, just a corner joint, uh, inside corner. But as I'm welding up, I'm looking to keep my wire pointed right about here relative to that puddle. This lower part here would indicate the slag layer that again is forming. If the wire is too high up in the plate, you'll see it actively digging a, 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 a cavern here above the bead. If the wire is too low, implying that you're traveling slow, and it's way down low near where the slag is, then you're just putting an enormous weld down. So you have to pick a travel speed. I would attempt to produce a fillet weld that's about a quarter inch in size to tune in my machine. As I'm welding uphill, I am paying attention to something that unfortunately I can't really get the camera to film all that well. Uh, maybe someday I will. Uh, I'm, I'm sure Jody over at WeldingTipsAndTricks.com has got it figured out. Um, maybe the guys at Weld.com, but, but I don't have it figured out yet how to get these clear weld shots. But essentially what I have is I have the wire coming into the middle of that puddle. And I'm just going to erase this just for clarity's sake, okay, for a second. And then just kind of lightly dash in the bottom where the slag is. If I'm looking down on that, and I typically am, I'm, I'm welding, you know, above it. Um, I want to make sure that my angles are correct. And that would mean that, you know, from, from an overhead position, uh, again, straight on. 
Let me move this over here. From an overhead position, uh, what I'm looking for in that corner is I want that wire to be straight in the corner. I want 45 degrees on each side, okay? I also want that wire to be pointed uphill slightly. Level is okay, slightly uphill is, is, is good. Anything beyond about five degrees and you're, and you're kind of pressing your luck. Um, once you get that angle extreme, the puddle, the lower part of the puddle, which is physically closer to you, because you've got to remember that from a side view, that weld bead is shaped, you know, kind of like this. Okay, so as my rod angle or my uh, wire angle is horizontal, I have a lot of clearance below that puddle. If you're one of those folks that likes to start with your gun, you know, in this position, and then you point your way up instead of lifting your arms, you will find that your wire will eventually be like this. And the clearance decreases. And what will happen is a tiny movement up and down will cause the wire to touch at the front edge of the puddle. And you'll burn your wire back by, you know, a quarter of an inch, which is huge, okay? Uh, almost instantly. So make sure you keep that wire level. What I'm trying to visualize as I'm coming in here is my wire, and I can see this very well with 052 diameter wire. My wire is the outer sheath of the wire is actually melting back. Okay, when this is tuned in smoothly, you can physically see the outer sheath melting back and you can see the flux shooting out of the center of that. And then the arc itself is going to fan out off to the side like this. Okay, So you're going to have the inner sheath of that wire, or the outer sheath, melt back slightly. It almost looks like my collar unbuttoned with my neck sticking out. It's this area right here. And I can see that when that machine is tuned in smoothly. If in fact I have a situation where I have, uh, I cannot see that, then I, I want to make adjustments. All right, so as we're welding, the wire is actually pointed in the upper third of the puddle. It is hard to see because the arc is so bright in the uh, video footage, and I hope to improve on that someday. But basically we're staying pointed directly towards the corner and yet we're up below the intersection where the liquid and the raw unwelded steel intersect. When I chip the slag off you'll see the bead is flat in profile and uh, when I shine the flashlight here you'll see a slight little dimple in the center of the face of the puddle where I stopped and that's where the weld shrunk from cooling so the wire was pointed above that uh, you know between that little dimple and the top of the actual puddle and we want to keep that wire in that upper third if you want to keep the weld small so this next clip is going to demonstrate welding too fast I am up ahead of the puddle and the wire is actually at the leading edge of the puddle and the arc is digging in. I can see it physically digging a hole. Um, of course, in the video footage here, the uh, puddle is a little bit uh, hidden by the arc. It's a little too bright, but you will see a gouging effect as you go up and the weld itself is going to have a more of a radius crown face you can see some undercut near the top and if you look uh, at the top you see that little spot in the puddle where the uh, puddle cooled and shrunk in on itself it leaves like a little depression and uh, the wire was well above that in the top 10 percent of that puddle when we're traveling too fast so in this last clip, I'm going to intentionally travel too slow. As I'm traveling up, the wire is way down low on the puddle. 
um, you know, a good quarter inch or so below where the liquid intersects the unwelded steel plate. Um, the weld is going to get very big. It, it will not have undercut, uh, and it may actually look decent, but it's going to be very, very large. Um, it's important to note that it can be difficult to notice the difference in travel speed with your hands between, you know, a, a normal uh, travel speed, uh, one that's very slow, and one that is a little bit fast that leaves undercut and a rounded face. So if you watch for the position of the wire on the puddle, it will give you an indication of your travel speed. When the wire is way down at the bottom where the slag is forming, you're going slow. When the wire is way up in the corner where the uh, puddle meets the unwelded plate, you're traveling fast. And when the wire is somewhere in the middle, you know, the center to upper third of that liquid pool, your travel speed is, uh, you know, what I would call a, a normal travel speed. So here we have a normal travel speed, uh, too fast. We get that humping action, skinny spots in the weld, maybe some undercut. And then at the top, we're traveling just really slow. So again, if you're trying to put a large weld down, you're, you're gonna travel slow. But you shouldn't have the middle section ever. All right, so again, want to make sure that that wire feed is adjusted correctly. Um, start on the horizontal, tune that wire speed in until you get it as smooth as possible. You don't want excessive spatter. Um, some wire will spatter a lot. It's just, it is what it is. If your voltage is relatively low because you're welding on thin material, uh, if you have a machine that's an old transformer power supply versus a modern inverter, again, performance is going to vary, okay? So don't, don't expect it to be perfect. But on the vertical, you should get a relatively smooth, consistent arc. And again, I would try to turn that wire while you're welding. And I know it's harder um, to do so, but if you can do that or have a buddy do it for you and just tell them, you know, up, up or down, down, okay, until you get that sweet spot. You want a little bit of snap crackle, okay? You need the wire driving in a little bit or your overheads will have excessive amounts of spray. The other thing to keep in mind is the electrical stick out. I find that when my wire speed and my setup is perfect, I have a situation where, um, and again, for, for, the, for the record, you know, contact tip to work distance is really what I'm talking about, but I tend to run my nozzle about flush with the tip. You know, you're not programming a robot here, okay? It doesn't have to be perfect, perfect. But essentially, you want to have enough visibility that you can see where the heck you're going and you can see a little bit of where you've been, all right? If I have the nozzle in so close that it's almost rubbing, then I need to pull it back and, and again, turn the wire speed up if that's the case. But when it's tuned in perfectly, I basically have a situation where at about three quarters of an inch, I see this. I see that smooth transition of wire I see the inner sheath or the outer sheath. I don't know why I keep saying that. I see the outer sheath of the wire melting back. I see that little flux line shoot out of the center. It's very subtle. Uh, again, easier to see on big wire. And then I have a nice soft arc with a little bit of crackle. If I pull the nozzle back to where I've got about an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half of stick out, then it should start to flicker and flutter and run erratically, okay? So as a general rule, while you're, while you're welding, if I can pull the gun way back, and by way back, I'm talking an inch and a half, okay? Not like a foot back. If I pull the nozzle back and it's still running smooth or still crackling, I've got too much wire. If I push the nozzle in so it's rubbing against the plate and it's still not crackling, I don't have enough wire. So I wanna be somewhere in that range. I want to be at a point where at a normal welding distance for visibility, it runs real smooth. I want to see this. If I push the gun in closer, it crackles a little more. If I pull the gun back, I start to get globular transfer, droplets drip, 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 drip off the end of the wire. 
and, and I don't want to weld with that if I can help it. Okay, so we'll, we'll take a look at the weld footage and we'll see if we can see some of this uh, in my fuzzy camera shots. All right, in terms of basic technique, um, I will go on record as saying I am not a fan of if it's got slaggy drag, okay? Um, I worked at Bath Ironworks for 28 years. I, I welded for 12 of those years. Um, I, you know, I wasn't, I, I wasn't in the uh, uh, welding field for that entire amount of time. But I, I can tell you, having worked in the welding school, welding engineering, uh, production welder, working here, done, you know, brake tests for fillets uh, up the wazoo and, and uh, x-ray butts, UT work, you know, that there's no need to drag uh, flux core on, on a fillet weld. Um, there are certainly times when, you know, dragging is to your advantage, uh, root pass of a butt or something like that. But again, when I say drag, I mean, I'm talking a shallow drag angle, five, 10 degrees max. Um, I'm, I'm a very strong proponent of 90 degree uh, travel angle uh, whenever possible. Um, you know, plus or minus a few degrees is not going to make a difference, you know, so uh, a 10 degree push or a 10 degree drag isn't really going to make that much difference. And if you do fillet brake tests and you really compare the penetration that you're getting, what you're going to find is that when you, when you drag the wire, you're not necessarily getting more penetration. The penetration has more to do with your position of the arc on the puddle. So if you're leading the puddle, you get lots of penetration, although you might get a crappy looking bead. If you're riding on the puddle, you'll get almost no penetration, although you might have a really pretty looking bead. It might be fat, but you know, just the same. It has a nice profile to it. So basically I try to keep roughly a 90 degree travel angle. I might have to start in a corner and drag out of it and then travel 90 degrees. And then I may end up pushing into the other edge of the corner because you know, it, it is what it is, right? You can't keep the gun perfectly 90 or at a perfect drag angle the entire way because it just doesn't work out that way. So the, the angles are not super critical, folks. And, and people that tell you that they do, I'd say, you know, do the brake test and, and, and really see for yourself. But roughly a 90 degree angle, and again, we're talking T-joints. We'll look at root passes on ceramic butts at some time later. That's a whole different ball game. But for right now, basic T-joints. So to start with, Horizontal. Um, I had a, a welding instructor years ago that uh, asked me in, with, in reference to which direction should I travel and he said, do you want to see where you're going or do you want to see where you've been? Um, I want to see where I'm going. I'm right handed. So I will always weld towards my body uh, if possible. I'll start out here and I'll weld this direction. If I weld left handed again, I start over here and I come towards my body. I want to see the front side of that nozzle. I want to see that where I'm traveling, I don't really care what's going on behind me because I've already been there and I'm past that. So on my fillet wells, being right-handed, I'm going to generally start on the right-hand side and work my way to the left. Now, you obviously need to be able to weld in both directions, but this video isn't about that. It's about just getting started. So when I put my weld down, I'm going to pull the trigger and I'm going to get started. And basically what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just draw in a, a little weld bead and I'll, I'll draw this in as if it's cool off. And my, my weld, of course, is going to taper off at the end. I'll have a, a, a puddle that's shaped kind of, uh, you know, teardrop shaped. And if I can draw straight lines, which is a challenge some days, I've got a weld bead that's going to look something like this. So if I stop welding uh, right here, there's my first pass. And the assumption here is, is that we're trying to put down a fillet weld that's in the quarter inch size, okay? Um, you start getting single pass fillets much above quarter inch, and you really don't get a ton of root penetration unless you're running really big wire with a lot of amperage, uh, a lot of voltage. And we're running 052 wire here at 24 volts. And if you do a mil spec brake test on 3 8 plate, um, you know, you don't get as much penetration as you think. I'm sorry for those people that think they're punching halfway through the plate. Um, you're not, okay? Uh, vertical up, you can get a fair amount. Horizontal overhead, you're just not getting as much as you would think, okay? So first pass, okay, on my horizontal. My vertical is going to be the same thing. Again, my, my gun angles are gonna be such that I'm gonna to have to start off, if I wanna to get to the bottom of this plate, 
the gun's gonna have to be pointed downhill in order to get down here, but I'm gonna roll that gun and I'm gonna come up, okay? Don't think that the nozzle, the gooseneck, has to be pointed directly away from you. You can lay that gun on its side and then with a simple roll the wrist, travel uphill. And I am always propped up on something, uh, as you wanna be. Um, for the video, the camera's in the way, it's really hard to film. My, my hat is, is off, uh, you know, figuratively to those guys that are really good at filming this stuff. Again, I'm not, maybe someday I will be. But again, I, I, I'm gonna make sure that whatever I have to do, however I'm holding that MIG gun, whether it's upside down, I'm pushing the finger, uh, trigger with my finger, whether it's laying on its side, it doesn't matter. I want to make sure that, that I'm maintaining the nozzle at a level attitude or slightly uphill. And again, at the bottom, yeah, I have to weld downhill. If I look at this marker, the wire coming out of the center, of, you know, the, the tip can reference the wire. If this is perfectly horizontal, this is already you know, yay far above the, 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 the deck here. So I'd have to point it downhill. But when you're actually welding, you never really want to point that wire down. Because when that wire is pointed downhill, you're pointing the wire at what's already hot. You want that wire pointed at the, the upper edge of that puddle. You want it pointed at the cold steel up above you, or at least in the general direction thereof, okay? We don't need to heat what's already hot. So keep, the, keep that level to slightly uphill. And don't be one of these guys, you know, that starts off like this and then points the gun or your stick electrode up. Raise your arms, folks, okay? So first pass. Again, the bead itself is going to be, uh, have that same basic shape, you know, as it comes out of that corner. Um, I'm gonna run that pass straight up through the middle. Uh, that's really crooked. Let's try this again. Not much better. You know, some days you can draw and some days you just can't, okay? I, I want that wire coming straight up the middle, folks, okay? I'm not going to have to weave this. Don't do any little triangles. Don't do any puddle manipulation. This is 71 T1M flux core. Um, just point it in the corner and go straight up, okay? If you want to do a, a slight little uh, left, right, left, right, and I mean the wire diameter maximum movement, okay? It's just a more of a nervous shake than a, than a, a conscious weave, then go for it, okay? But as a general rule, you should be able to point that wire in the corner and boom, straight uphill, okay? Again, angles, 45 degrees, dead center in the middle of the plate, slightly uphill. Again, here, 90 degree travel angle, and the, the actual uh, gun angle, 45 degrees. You're trying to split whatever angle you're presented with. Same thing on the overhead though. I'm gonna again start with that uh, puddle uh, in position uh, on the overhead. I have to point that wire up, okay? Uh, I can't talk and draw at the same time. Ugh. All right, here we go. So I, I basically have a weld puddle that's shaped roughly the same. So my gun is gonna be pointed, you know, really more uphill, 15, 20 degrees off the vertical axis. I'm not in the corner at a 45 on the overhead because gravity is kicking my butt here, okay? So again, just watch the liquid. And again, 90 degree travel angle, slight push, okay, slight drag, okay. But you don't have to drag it. And I would argue that your welds will look a lot better at 90 degrees than at any other position for your travel, okay? Now, that's the route pass, okay? So we'll take a look at the footage uh, again as we're going here. So here we are welding on a horizontal and the wire should be pointed, you know, directly towards the corner. It's not actually in the intersection of the uh, two cold plates it's back on the liquid a little bit but it's important that we not be so far forward on the liquid that we put down a tiny weld basically the faster we travel the closer the wire will be to the actual intersection of the cold unwelded steel plates and when we slow down that wire will be further back so here's the finished weld. 
Now going up on the vertical plate. Again, the MIG gun nozzle should be level to slightly uphill. Uh, at the very, very bottom, it will obviously have to point down a little bit in order to get the bottom. But you want to roll your wrist and make sure that nozzle is level to slightly uphill. Wire should be positioned so that it is, again, a little ways below the top edge of the liquid. And if you notice the bright area of the arc, which doesn't look that much different in real life than it does on video, uh, that will give you some indication as to how flat the puddle is. On the overhead, again, uh, we are pointed, you know, directly into that corner. Although the arc is, uh, you know, a little bit harder to see in this shot, the wire position is in the same place as it was for horizontal and for vertical. Again, the faster I travel, the closer the wire is to the front edge of the liquid. The MIG gun is pointed more vertically. Um, it's not really at a 45 degree angle. It's more like 20 or 30 degrees because gravity is holding that, uh, pulling the puddle down. And again, the travel angle is roughly 90 degrees. It looks like a slight drag angle from this camera position. Uh, and it might be slight at the very beginning, but it's not really intentionally a drag angle. And in all three positions, the weld beads should be relatively flat. Okay, what I want to talk about now are cover passes, okay? Now, the cover passes are the tricky part for most people. The, the idea really is that when you put the cover passes on, in theory, on a 90-degree joint, you have one bead that's covered by two, and that's covered by three, covered by four, so on and so forth. So the beads need to stack up, and I always picture firewood, you know, stacking. So... Essentially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a situation where I have the ability to put in my passes on top of one another. And again, I'm going to have a little bit of penetration if I kind of show this first bead okay, in profile. I need to put these passes on top of one another in such a manner that they produce a predictable weld size, right? So I have here a weld that's, that's say this references a quarter inch fillet weld. And, and again, that quarter inch would be from the, the root of that weld out to this toe. So that is my quarter inch. If I'm gonna put down a 3 8 weld or a half inch weld, or anything that's a multiple of an eighth, a clean eighth inch, I will typically start with a quarter inch fillet weld. Now, if, if the weld size calls for something smaller, then that's a whole other situation, but we're, we're focused on structural work here. So smaller weld sizes aren't as common. But again, if, if, if I were gonna go with a, a multiple of an eighth, which a quarter is, then I will start with a quarter inch fillet weld. After that, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to add an eighth of an inch to each leg every single time. So I'm gonna end up with a quarter inch weld. My next weld up is gonna be three eighths. My next size up will be half inch, and so on and so forth. So I'm gonna do that one little layer at a time. So I'm gonna focus on this and let's see what we got. Okay, the next pass ultimately needs to extend that leg by an eighth of an inch. It will cover approximately 80%, 90% of the previous weld pass. I am not, and this is important, 
I am not pointing my wire at that corner when I'm welding. If I do, I will have way more weld on the lower leg than I want. You have to watch the puddle. And if you pay attention to the puddle, you will likely discover that the wire is being pointed somewhere around here, a little bit above the lower toe. When I put my second pass on, again, I'm looking to extend this. If, if this is a quarter uh, from the corner, you know, then I have another eighth of an inch. That's probably a little too tall. And then I have another eighth of an inch to get to half. So again, each of these little reference black marks is an eighth of an inch. I need to extend the puddle up to this. It will cover, again, 75, 80%, maybe more in some cases of the previous pass. You need to get overlap on your flux core beads, okay? You are not covering half of that pass. You're covering way more than half of that pass. And again, I am not gonna have my wire pointed up here at the corner of the original weld. It is going to be somewhere below that, likely there. You've got to make sure, folks, that you're watching the puddle spread out, okay, and extend. When you get done, you want a bead shape that is slightly uh, crowned to flat at a minimum. You do not want a bead shape that is shaped like this. And that occurs when the first pass is way out here and the second pass is up too high. So for my next layer, again, I would watch uh, down here. And again, I'm never gonna put the wire in the corner. It's always gonna be on the previous weld, approximately right there. And I will have a bead that covers, you know, from this extra eighth up into here somewhere, you know, in profile. My next bead is gonna be run Again, on that previous pass, not really up at the toe, but slightly there. And again, I will cover from the midpoint up to here. And if you think about the geometry of what's being covered, the cross-sectional area, the first pass is huge. And as the layers get further and further out, the actual thickness of the bead gets less and less. So you are not putting as much weld down, which means you're traveling faster, okay? The last pass, again, is not going to be way up in this corner. It's going to be slightly here. And again, the trick is to watch the liquid. So I'm again looking to spread that bead from up above and, and again, cover somewhere in here. Okay. So this is approximately what that cross section will look like. All right. Now let's go back to our other images. So, all right, let me back up. So on my horizontal, pass number two is not going to be run down that toe. It's going to be run above the toe of the weld. My wire will actually be pointed probably right about here. And that pass will create a bead that is shaped like so. Most of that weld bead is gonna cover the previous pass. So I'm gonna end up with something that looks approximately like this, okay? Most of that weld bead is gonna cover the previous pass. I, I don't want the wire pointed at the corner, okay? I don't wanna end up with a situation, and I'll draw this in, cr in cross-sectional view, just quickly here. Here's my root pass, okay? What I don't want to do is end up with a situation where my other pass is way out here and my last pass is way up here and end up with this K-shaped weld face, okay? That is absolutely 
no good. And it's so easy to do when you're first learning, okay? On my vertical, same thing. I'm gonna not run my bead out on that toe. I'm not gonna let the wire touch the toe of that weld. It'll, it might snug up against it, okay? The left side of the wire might bump against the left edge of the toe, but I don't wanna cross it, or I will end up with something like this down here. So again, that weld, and this is hard to see in the video. It's the reason I'm drawing this. Again, I, I you know, better techniques, better camera, an assistant would be wicked awesome. Um, but, you know, again, I'm going to end up with something like this. I'm going to cover 80%, maybe, maybe even a little bit more of that previous pass. Okay. Overhead, again, same thing. Okay, I'm sounding like a broken record now. Your angles on the overhead are gonna change slightly uh, as they are on all of these positions. Whoops, that's a horrible attempt at drawing that. But again, the amount of weld that I cover is not really going to change all that much. Okay, again, I'm gonna cover roughly 75, 80%, you know, of the previous pass with almost every other pass, okay? So here we're on a horizontal multi-pass weld. Um, the biggest thing here really is wire position. And the wire position, again, is got to be placed so that we are covering 75 or 80 percent of the previous weld. And we're only letting a little bit of that weld come out uh, on the bottom plate, basically extending the lower leg of the weld. The wire is not being pointed in the corner that is made by the toe of the weld and the lower plate. It is pointed slightly above that. So the wire is actually riding on the previous bead, okay? not in the corner made where the previous bead is uh, touching the bottom plate. And there's a slight witness of the original bead still left showing at the top, although it's very slight. And the wire for the third pass, uh, when we get there, will be uh, on the second pass. Now here on the vertical, we uh, can see this a little bit better. The wire again is not uh, in the corner of the left side of the bead. Um, I'm going up the left side of the bead just by choice. I could have gone up the right. But the wire is on the previous pass, okay? It's not in the corner. It's on the previous bead. Granted, it's very close to the corner, but it's not out on that corner. That would put too much weld to the left and it would make the uh, welds not overlap properly for a triple pass. Again, the finished product should be such that the second pass almost completely covers the first pass. And this is true for all positions. Same on the overhead. Again, the wire is not pointed at the lower corner. Uh, it is pointed on the weld slightly above the lower corner. And the gun angles will stay basically the same. The MIG gun is pointed more or less up uh, you know, not out at 45 degrees, but perhaps out, you know, 20 degrees or so. And you can play with those gun angles, but you should have a relatively... I'm going to go ahead here and I'm going to draw on the last bead in green. I'm staggering these out because that's what I did when I welded the, uh, the, the footage that we're about to see. Um, Basically, same thing. I'm not gonna let the wire get way up on that toe of the weld. I don't want the wire way out on this toe of the weld. I don't want the wire way up on that toe of the weld. I wanna be slightly inboard of it. I want the beads to, to overlap one another. I don't want them like so. You've gotta pay attention to that. So with that wire position, really slightly inboard of the original toe of the weld, and I mean slightly, but you know, a little bit makes a difference. We're in a trade here where the difference between a great looking weld and a, and a, 
and an average looking well and a garbage looking well are itty bitty teeny variations, right? You take a machine that's all tuned in, give it to the pro, give it to the new guy, give it to the rank amateur, you're gonna have awesome middle garbage, okay? And, and it's not the equipment, it's little techniques, okay, little differences. So again, here, that bead shape is going to be uh, roughly up on that other plate about a quarter, uh, an eighth of an inch. We're extending the toe of the well by that roughly eighth of an inch. And again, I'm gonna come down here and that well will cover. And again, this bead is really flat. So it's not, it's, we're talking this pass right here, okay? It is not a thick well. It's a relatively thin well. So again, it, it, it looks like it's huge, but it's thin and it's wide, okay? Vertical, same thing, wire position roughly here, inboard. And again, that weld will come out, you know, come out onto this edge roughly an eighth of an inch, approximately, you know. Uh, and again, it depends on the weld sizes that you're trying to produce. And you're going to get a pass, a coverage pattern that looks something like that. Now, I weld left to right. I like to start on the side that's closest to me and work away. It's easier for me to concentrate on the toe of the weld that's near my eyesight than to look on the opposite side. But again, there are times when you have to go the other way. If I'm welding left-handed, I would again weld the side closest to me and my, my red pass would have been on the right instead of the left. Um, that's personal preference. However, you want to work from bottom up in general. So on my horizontals, um, I'm going to weld always from the bottom up. On my overheads, I'm going to weld from the bottom up. Um, can you weld from the top down? Sure, you can. If you're chipping your slag, it's not going to make any difference. And if you're welding around a pipe, a penetration, a piece of square tube, there comes a point in time where the pattern kind of gets changed. Topic for another video, okay? But for now, bottom up. So again, here, I'm going to have that wire pointed, not right at the top, but slightly, again, below. And, and the shape of that bead is going to be like so. And again, I'm going to have coverage that is going to cover a large portion of the second pass. And we're looking at something like this, okay? Look at the third pass, and again I'm pointing the wire at the top edge, or just below the top edge of the original pass. I'm not letting the wire get quite up into the toe of that weld, it needs to be slightly below it, or there won't be enough overlap between the beads. And the finished weld will be excessively large. The finished product should be relatively flat as we have here, and uh, we'll wire brush this up and take a look at it. Now, on the horizontal, I'm going to run a few more passes. Just to kind of show how these would continue to stack up. So again, this bottom pass, a little bit closer. Uh, I, again, I apologize that you can't see the wire directly in the arc shot, but the wire is not pointed down in the corner of the toe of that weld. It is slightly above it. The next pass, I will be riding basically right on the top edge of the toe of the bead I just put down, but again, not completely up on the intersection of those two. It's, you know, slightly below it. Uh, it might only be the wire diameter below it, but it is still below it. And then when I get to the third pass, uh, I still have a slight witness of the previous layer, which will be pass number three total. I'm now going to complete pass number six. And the wire will be just below that top edge where the weld bead and the plate appear to intersect. Not quite up in the corner, but just ever so slightly below it. And we're really just watching the liquid uh, flow and blend into the top plate and also blending the welds together. So you get a, a rough idea as to what this looks like.
Again, filming with a camera uh, in between you and the arc shots is uh, kind of a pain in the butt. But you get the picture. Now the spatter that's on there uh, should come off. Like on the vertical, we've got, uh, again, a pass on the right-hand side. Uh, I just chose to do the first pass on the left, but you can see in this shot that, the, again, the wire is not right out in that corner. It is inboard. It is on pass number two. So, uh, again, I want to create a situation where the beads overlap a lot, you know, roughly 70%. start to see how this is going to work. Nice flat welds. And again, if you look at the center of that puddle, the center of that puddle is not out in the corner of pass number one. The last pass on the overhead, I, again, same thing. I'm sounding like a broken record. But the wire is not pointed right in the corner at the toe of the first weld or really at the toe of the second weld. It is slightly below it, and I'm watching the overlap. So as I chip the slag off, again, we should have a nice, relatively flat weld bead. Uh, the finished product of flux core should be reasonably flat. Get a flashlight out here in a second and uh, take a look at this. And you should have a reasonably good weld. Again, pay close attention to the ends of the welds, which is shaped like the puddle. And notice where the center of that is. That's where the wire is. So here's the overhead. This is down on the deck now. Not perfect. But again, you weld with the camera in front of you and see how it comes out. Yours might look better than mine. The horizontal, uh, again, I ran a lot of passes quick. So we've got uh, quite a few welds on there. And if I flip it around, again, here's that vertical. I ran the vertical short because uh, the camera really, uh, I couldn't focus on much more than that. And I don't have someone to pan the camera for me. But you get the idea. And that's flux score. So it, it's it's important to think about the the cross section that you're putting down and the speed. I would strongly recommend to anyone starting out, especially when you get on butt welds or you get on groove welds, okay, uh, pipe, anything like that, that you do bead planning. All right, you want to make sure that you're planning your beads. So if I'm doing a uh, practice for, for, for welds of a particular size, then I want gauges on hand, right? I want to make sure I'm getting the correct size. And then when I shoot for a 3 8 weld, I want to make sure I'm getting a 3 8 weld. Some people will, their quarter inch welds are 5 16 plus, and their next weld, which is 3 8 is closer to a half inch. So we want to be able to control those weld sizes. So what you should really do is, is, is you know, make a, a little uh, T-joint, you know, and draw in what your pattern should be. And you can get a feel if you draw it, you know, roughly to scale. And I know it's small, but, you know, you get a pencil and paper, you can do it. Um, you want to get a feel for what that next bead should look like in terms of, you know, travel speed. So that's a big, huge weld. Got to go slow. Up here, these passes are thinner. I'm going to pick my speed up, okay? On a groove weld, again, topic for another video, but real quick, do the same thing. Draw in what you want to put down, and then on a separate sheet, or on the same sheet, but above it or below it, draw in what you actually got, okay? And then you can start learning your own limitations. But for right now, this is what we're looking at, okay? Uh, if I put additional layers on here, like I drew in, I'm, I'm again, I'm trying to add that eighth of an inch. Now, if I was looking for a 9 16 weld, I would try to put roughly a 3 16 weld on my first pass, or maybe a 5 16 weld, if I think I can get the root penetration. 
And then again, I still add an eighth of an inch every single time, okay? If I'm working in, the, in metric units, then I'll start with maybe a six millimeter weld, and I'll try to add roughly three millimeters per side uh, every single time. So my eye really, and, and again, in, in, I'm in America, we're still doing mostly uh, uh, US weld sizes here, but I'm gonna try to get my kids in my school to memorize what a quarter inch weld looks like. It's, it's roughly the same thickness as the plate. This is not on a scale. Um, and then if they can get a quarter inch weld and a three sixteenths weld, and they can memorize what one eighth looks like, they can hit every weld size that's ever gonna be asked for them by using this basic technique.